welcome to Cross Isle Talk, a podcast about how BIPOC mental health practitioners and scholars can work together to better support BIPOC communities and each other. My name is Dr. Donna Dimanarig, and my background is in clinical psychology. I am currently an assistant professor in the psychology department at the University of Bridgeport. I'm also the secretary and historian for the Asian American Psychological Association, the finance officer of DOFA, which is a division of Philippine X Americans for AAPA, and a member of the mental health subcommittee for the Phil M Resource and Response Team Task Force. So I'm very excited for our guest today, Dr. Kevin Coakley. He holds the Oscar and Anne Mosey Regents Professorship for Educational Research and Development in the College of Education at the University of Texas at Austin. He is a fellow of the University of Texas System and University of Texas Academy of Distinguished Teachers, Director of the Institute for Urban Policy Research and Analysis, and Professor of Educational Psychology in African and African Diaspora Studies. His research and teaching can be broadly categorized in the areas of African-American psychology, with a focus on racial identity and understanding the psychological and environmental factors that impact African-American students' academic achievement. Dr. Coakley studies the psychosocial experiences of African-American students and students of color and is currently exploring the imposter phenomenon and its relationship to mental health and academic outcomes. He was elected to fellow status in the American Psychological Association for his contributions to ethnic minority psychology and counseling psychology. He is the recipient of the Charles and Shirley Thomas Award for mentoring ethnic minority students. He holds the title of Distinguished Psychologist and received the Scholarship Award from the Association of Black Psychologists. His research has been recognized in media outlets including the New York Times, USA Today, and Inside Higher Education. I am very excited and honored to have Dr. Kevin Coakley with us as our inaugural guest. Welcome. Thank you. I, I'm happy to be um, part of your inaugural um, podcast. <laughs> and um, as you know, the impetus for this podcast was really the events that started last year. And I'm really talking about uh, COVID-19 and how that's affected uh, BIPOC communities disproportionately, whether it's a lack of access to healthcare and information or even anti-Asian racism. Then of course, with police brutality, the murder of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, and the ensuing protests um, after that. And it's clear now more than ever that as a society, as a people, we do have a lot of unresolved racial issues in our country, a lot of violence and trauma being inflicted on BIPOC communities. So it was my hope to start a conversation with other BIPOC mental health practitioners and scholars about what we can do to help each other, to build coalition and to better serve our communities. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm glad that you sort of are pursuing this and, and I certainly have some thoughts about what can be done to to better serve and to support um, black people in the African American community? So, um, yeah, let, let's let's talk about it. Let's bring it on. So, um, the first question I do have is: How can we um, use our profession and our privilege to support African Americans in our communities? Well, I, I think that the events of um, really the past year, and, and especially um, the summer really shed a light on, on some of the issues that, that black folks have been experiencing for, for many, many years uh, with, you know, the, the killing of Breonna Taylor, uh, with the killing of, of George Floyd and, and so many others. Uh, Ahmaud Arbery um, yeah. who was also a name that was, um, you know, well known during this, this past summer. Uh, what I think what our profession can do is is to acknowledge the reality of what uh, Dr. Keanu Rice um, and others have referred to as anti-Black. Mm -hmm. And when Dr. Keanu Ross, Ross wrote her um, op-ed in the New York Times, and Dr. Ross is someone who was a postdoctoral fellow who worked in my institute uh, a few years ago, but she wrote this op-ed um, in the New York Times. 
And essentially, you know, you know, she argued that that the word racism is just not sufficient to capture what we are experiencing in, in this historical moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we're all familiar with racism. We, I, you know, most of us understand it, or at least many of us understand it. And, and certainly how it is applicable to the experiences of many um, groups of people of color. But she, she argued that, that what we witnessed and experienced this past summer, um, the word racism is, is not sufficient. And, and she argued that what we really need to be talking about is this idea of sort of anti-blackness, mm -hmm. you know, and this, this very idea that, you know, the sort of having disgust, disdain for the very existence of black people, of black, mm -hmm of black lives and so the the idea that that anti-blackness is 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 so um central to much of what we see in terms of the the atrocities that that happen to black people i think is something that our profession needs to grapple with and you know psychology uh, you know to its credit i think has done a pretty good job of of acknowledging racism you know we've mm -hmm. done a lot of research on racism um, we've addressed it in, in research, we've addressed it in theories, we've addressed it in clinical practice. But there hasn't really been, I, I think, a discussion specifically about anti-Blackness mm -hmm. and, and how anti-Blackness is a, is a specific form of, of, of dehumanization um, directed towards Black people that, that requires, I think, additional um, uh, redress um, that that I think just talking about racism doesn't really give us. Why do you think there hasn't really been, you know, in the forefront, why haven't really really addressed this whole notion of anti-blackness? Well, I you know, I, I think part of it is that just that people um people would just see it as, well, you're just talking about racism. I, I think mm -hmm. that they would just sort of see it as just racism. Mm -hmm. Um and it's not just racism. Uh, you know, when we're talking about racism, you know, typically we're 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 talking about, you know, feelings of you know superiority mm -hmm. uh, directed towards people that are sort of seen or viewed as being in some ways inferior. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know we have you know lots lots of social psychological research that sort of talks about in group out group and mm -hmm. all those sort of you know mechanisms you know that help us better understand sort of racist attitudes. But but anti blackness is really a, a different a different animal here because we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about again you know sort of having having disgust having disdain at directed toward black people when that 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 having an inability to, to even see a black person as being human in the mm -hmm. way that you would see other groups of people and that's what makes anti-blackness a different animal than just sort of and I hate to sort of even put it this way, garden variety racism. No, I actually like that, that garden variety. Ring. That's a really good phrase there. But yeah, there there is a, when you think about it, there is this level of racism and it, a lot of the um, this, like you said, the human dehumanization of a particular group is really directed towards the black community, the African-American community. There's a lot of that. And it's not just um, you know, subtle racism, even there's a lot of uh, explicit racism, as you, as we can see in, in those uh, videos of, you know, the video of George Floyd, that's just, you know, brutal, um, outright racism that you see there. Absolutely. And it's systemic. So <laughs> that it is. Yeah. And just talking about it, I know it's, it's, it's heavy. It's a heavy topic to talk about. And I, I still haven't seen that video and I refuse to see it because I already know what what that video is about. It's just too much emotionally. Yeah. No, it, it, it's a difficult video to see my. Um, you know, I remember my 12 year old son, we my, we my wife and I, you know, made a concerted effort to shield our children. We have a 12 year old mm -hmm. son and a seven year old daughter. Uh, we made a concerted effort to to try to keep them from seeing uh, that video which was difficult because yeah. as, as, as you remember it it was really really all over social media mm -hmm. but there's this thing called TikTok. And, <laughs> oh my goodness you know, and and our son unfortunately saw the um you know the video on some TikTok video and mm. he came to me you know being really upset 
And, um, you know, so I had to have uh, what, you know, many black folks refer to as the talk. Um, you know, that was one of the, one of the more difficult um, things that I had to do as a parent, talking to my black son about why this white police officer mm -hmm. so callously had his knee pressed upon the neck of George Floyd and, you know, ultimately sort of, you know, killing him. So, so yeah, that, that was difficult. Yeah, no, I can only imagine. And, you know, for, for people outside of that community, it's a, our privilege is we don't have to deal with that. We don't have to have that kind of talk with our children. And um, unfortunately, that is a talk that, you know, in many African American families that they have to have with their children, um, how to behave when you're being stopped by the police officer, because you can be in your best behavior, but you could still, you know, be killed. Um, you can be innocent, but still be killed. And that's just reality. Um, but yeah. Yeah. How can mental health clinicians support their African American clients or what are some effective interventions? Well, now I you know, <laughs> I will speak from the vantage point of of someone who is, you know, a, a researcher and professor. And I mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a clinician, so I, I don't know that I can speak necessarily to effective interventions, but what I can say is that when I'm teaching, for example, graduate students in multicultural counseling classes, mm -hmm. you know, I, I I talk about the importance of of being, you know, non-defensive, um, mm -hmm. of of really, and and I would, I would say this for whomever your client is, it doesn't have to be a you know a black client, but but especially you know I think for for black clients or African American clients, that that really sort of hearing and acknowledging and validating what they're saying about their lived experience um, is, is really important. Um, and I, I think, you know, sometimes just sort of even saying something as simple as, you know, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not black. I, you know, I, I don't know what it's like to live in a world where, you know, if I, if I go to a store, I could be followed. I don't know what it's like mm -hmm. to live in a world where, you know, I have to tell my black son, that he has to be incredibly careful when he's in the presence of police officers uh, because he could be seen as threatening and, and he could lose his life. I don't know what it's like to, you know, fill in the blank. And, and so I think that for your, your African-American clients, for your black clients, hearing, hearing their therapist sort of just be very candid in that acknowledgement that they don't know what it's like um, to, to, to have that lived experience is incredibly, I think, validating. And I think mm. it, it goes a long ways in terms of helping um, build build trust um, in the therapeutic relationship. Right, which is very important in therapy anyway to build to build that trust. And one thing too, I, I do know that uh, within the Black uh, or African-American communities, there's this distrust when it comes to, um, you know, healthcare practitioners and even mental health because of the history of racism that's also pervasive in in our field yeah no i mean in, so in in black psychology you know one of our most popular um constructs that we sort of talk about is the idea of cultural mistrust mm -hmm. and you know and, and cultural mistrust really it when i when we sort of talk about it, it it came about you know you know really in sort of the late 60s or you know early 70s and there was this idea of black people being un, unnecessarily uh, sort of paranoid of, of white, you know, white people. In, in the book Black Rage by Greer and Cobbs, two African-American psychiatrists, they talk about this notion of, of, of um, sort of paranoia and, and, and why, you know, black people, you know, understandably, you know, should be, you know, sort of paranoid, you know, around, um, you know, you know, being in certain situations, you know, their interactions with white people, but right. part of, but part of the problem was is that that paranoia has such, you know, it's it has such a clinically negative, you know, sort of you know um, connotation um, because it suggests that the individuals are are feeling and thinking in ways that are unreasonable, that that aren't rooted in like data or mm -hmm. experience. Um, which is why, of course, you know, you, you know, we talk about people with paranoid schizophrenia, you know, and that we have ways to assess that. But black psychologists said, well, no, that's probably not the best word to use because of the clinical 
sort of connotations. Um, we're not really mm. talking about paranoia. We're really talking about, you know, you really need to be mistrustful um, because history has uh, shown us that when we have not been mistrustful um, in certain situations in, in our interactions and dealings, particularly with white power structures, that, mm -hmm. that has been, you know, to our detriment. And so, so this idea of culture mistrust really evolved um, as a way to sort of talk about and to validate in, in non-deficit oriented, non-pathological ways, um, this, this sort of psychological predisposition that many black people have when interacting with white institutions and with white, you know, authority figures. Right. I mean, there's the, you know, the Tuskegee syphilis studies, like, uh, his, uh, you know, events such as that um, is the reason mm -hmm. why the Black and African American communities are distrustful. It, it, it absolutely is. And I, I'll let you in on something because I, I recently wrote um, or co co wrote a, a blog for Psychology Today mm -hmm. that sort of addressed this issue of, um, you know, sort of vaccine hesitancy uh, um, yeah. or mistrust. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the observations that I've made is initially I thought that the the hesitancy, the sort of mistrust around the vaccines, I, I thought that you know you could sort of correlate that with with education, right? You know, mm -hmm. so you know, in my mind, you know, individuals who are <clears throat> who are more educated, who have a better understanding of of science, you know. Um, would be less mistrustful and be would be you know certainly more willing um, to get the vaccine, and so I when I shared you know on social media this blog that I wrote, uh, I had some very interesting responses to it, and you know one of my you know colleagues that I know who is a a fellow um, you know black psychologist we we know each other through the Association of Black Psychologists, you know he responded to my um, social media I think I posted it on. Um, LinkedIn, if I'm not mistaken, among other places. And, you know, he basically said, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking the vaccine. And he said, I'm not taking the vaccine for the reasons you outlined in your piece about the history of Tuskegee and the experimentation on black bodies. Now, he, and he was not the, the only educated black person that sort of mm -hmm. communicated to me that they weren't going to take it. So that just blew my theory you know, out of the water. I'm like, well, we, we can't just reduce it to education because even with education, you see that, that culture mistrust is right. incredibly powerful in our community. Right, yeah, yeah. So how do you think we can actually bridge that that gap? Oh. I know, I know. That, <laughs> that's you're, a huge, you're, you're huge asking act. a tough question. <laughs> that's a... You know, how do you get rid of culture mistrust uh, <laughs> you know, after hundreds of years of I you know. Know, reasons to be mistrustful? Solve the problem, Dr. Coakley, solve the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's, I. If, if I had the answer, I could perhaps be a rich man. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think, well, I, I think that what you're seeing, and I think this is sort of what needs to happen is, you need to have very prominent, you know, people in the Black community, you know, in the African-American community, who who speak to the community about the importance and the safety of mm -hmm. taking the vaccine. And, and, and you already see these, these efforts taking place. Um, the president of Morehouse, uh, the Morehouse um, School of Medicine, mm -hmm. you know, you know, among other people has, and of course Morehouse School of Medicine being, you know, um, historical black college um, medical school, um, you know, so has sort of, you know, gone on this public, uh, um, this this public effort to really educate uh, the black community about the vaccine and why it's so mm -hmm. important. And, and, and you've had other, you know, sort of, you know, prominent black people who've done the same thing. Because I think that in terms of messaging and in terms of sort of addressing that culture mistrust, you know, the community will feel much better and will feel much, much more trusting when they can see people who look like them, right. who they know have their best interests at heart, speak to them in, in, in clear um, ways that, that communicate that it's, it's important and that it's safe that, that we all do this. So I, I think that that more than anything is, is what is going to be needed to sort of help deal with the culture of mistrust. Right. And this is why it's really important that we have, um, you know, many uh, Black or African American people going into the science fields, um, having that representation. 
which actually is a great segue for my next question because I I am a uh, a professor, so I, I haven't been uh, doing clinical practice in several years, and the majority of my students are um, Black American students, um, and this is very important to me because one of the things that I want to be as a professor um, is how can I support my my Black students in the classroom or outside of the classrooms? Um, no, that's that's um, wonderful that you have so many you know black students that you you know have the privilege to be able to work with. Um, one of the ways that I think that you can sort of continue to to build trust and and to build their relationship and to support them is to to show an interest in in, in doing research that is directly linked and related to mm. the the. The issues that they are confronted with, um, and, and obviously involving them, um, mm -hmm, right? Right. That, that, that's 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 key. And I, right. I would say this about any individual from any group that would not be part of the group that they are interested in, sort of researching that that you have to involve the people from those communities in some way, um, in, in you know, so that people don't sort of view you as an outsider who's sort of exploiting or taking advantage of or profiting mm -hmm. professionally from doing research, you know, with that community. But but when you can sort of involve those students um, and, and to really take a genuine interest in wanting to, to conduct research that you know is meaningful for them, mm -hmm. I, I think that that would be tremendously helpful and go a long ways towards helping you to show your support of them. Right, right. And um, how about within the classroom itself in terms of the lectures and, you know, um, the content of our lectures and what we lecture on? Um, how do you think professors, um, white or other um, uh, professors of color, how can they support their uh, black students? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, I think the, the the most obvious way is is making sure that you are are including content that reflects, you know, you know, the students in some way. I mean, I think, you know, that's probably obvious. Right. Um, and, you know, and again, I, you know, I don't know the exact demographics of the students, you know, you said that, you know, you're working, you work with a lot of black students. Do you, do you happen to have, um, you know, you know, white students or other non black students who are, you know, in the classes as well? We do. Yeah. Um, the majority of our students in uh, the university, uh, they're mostly black and Latinx students. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Well, that wow. That's uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That's 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 definitely I think a, a different experience than than many of us have had, um, mm -hmm. particularly those of us who are at predominantly white schools. So 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 what I'm going to suggest here may not be as relevant for for your particular situation, but I'll, I'll say it anyway that. You know, when if you're in a classroom and and something is said that clearly, you know, is a you know offensive that you know might be you know sort of you know anti-black in ways that maybe even the students themselves don't don't recognize. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's always important that you sort of address it in the moment, um, and that that and that you sort of you know indicate what is the boundaries of sort of acceptable. Um, discourse and, and hopefully again in your situation hopefully that's not something that you've had to deal with the only reason that i mentioned it is that you know in my my book the myth of black anti-intellectualism i share an, an anecdote that happened you know at my university where i had an african-american student who was in, in a class and and an incredibly problematic you know i would say racist statement mm -hmm. was was made by one of her her fellow students mm -hmm. and the professor in the class did not address it at all. Um, and, and, and when you have that happen in a class, it, it does so much to, to just um, negatively impact um, those black students mm -hmm. when they believe that things can be said and not be confronted when particularly when they are racist or sort of anti-black. But again, that's hopefully not your situation given where you are. But but so, you know, addressing comments that when you need to be, when you need to address them when they're sort of, you know, racist or anti-black, uh, providing examples uh, in the classroom that that reflect 
you know, the students whom you're teaching. Um, and the other thing, and, and this is a more sort of general comment that I think um, would probably apply to, to all students, but I, I think, especially for black students, is, is showing a, a humility in, when you're teaching that, yeah. you know, and, and particularly if you're teaching about something that is, is, is about their experience, you know, you have to, you know, I'm sure you've heard the term cultural humility mm -hmm. and, and you, and you really need to display and exhibit a, a sort of cultural humility that, that basically says, like, you know, I don't, I don't know everything. I don't, and, and there's some things that I can't know um, mm -hmm. by, by virtue of, you know, having a different lived experience. Um, and I think it's okay for professors to say, you know, I don't know, mm -hmm. um, and I, or I, I can't, you know, or I can't assume that I understand this right. in ways that you might understand it. So I, I think that whenever you can communicate that in classes where, where you have diverse students and black students, you know, in particular, when it's, you know, speaking to their experience, I think that that goes a long way. I think that that will give you more, more credibility in their eyes mm -hmm. and it will help garnered you know um more um more trust on uh, from them towards you yeah i i completely agree with that because uh usually when i first start off the semester i you know especially my multicultural psychology class um i would ask the students how do you want to be addressed in terms of your identity because you, you can say bl some people prefer black americans some people prefer african americans some people prefer Jamaican Americans or whatever specific identity mm -hmm. they have. So, and I tell them there's no wrong way, you know, in terms of how you identify yourself. And whenever I do that, there's this sense of oneness that I feel in the classroom. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with you in terms of that cultural humility. I don't know everything, especially when it comes to other people's culture. And I'm here to also learn from you. You're my teacher in that aspect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> and um, in terms of uh, BIPOC, uh, I know you can't really speak for much with mental health uh, practitioners, but how, how do you think other BIPOC mental health professionals, and in particular, Asian Americans, better support their African American colleagues and um, the African American community in general? Well, I... I, if, if we go back again to the events of the summer, and and I've, I've seen this happen, you know, even with, you know, sort of prior incidents involving police brutality against the Black community, I have been really, really, I have been very impressed with um, my Asian American colleagues um, who have, who have been very um, supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've seen, you know, you know, like, like posts, you know, in terms of like, you know, you know, emails and, and social media, like I've seen, you know, Asian Americans who have been very vocal about supporting Black Lives Matter, um, about sort of addressing anti-Blackness, uh, even within their own communities. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been incredibly, incredibly impressed with that. And, and so I, I would just say sort of continuing those efforts. And I, and I, and I think it should be reciprocal, um, you know, not to get too far off the, the point, but, you know, as you may know, I am the the president elect of Division Forty Five, the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Race, and Ethnicity. Of Congratulations, APA. by the way. Thank you. <laughs> and you know, and I'm still sort of working through what my my theme will be in my presidential initiatives. Um, but one of the things that I'm sort of toying with is this idea of how how communities of color can really be more supportive of each other um, and not so so what's the word not not so um ethnocentrically focused on their own um sort of community concerns that they aren't able to to be responsive to other communities and so that, that's why i have really appreciated seeing asian americans be supportive of the black lives matter movement mm -hmm. and and i and I would, I would like to see black folks and african americans also be similarly supportive of some of the issues that are equally important to the asian american community mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, that's really definitely one way that, you know, we can progress in our society because overall, we're all living in this one society. We're all somehow experiencing some sort of, um, you know, discrimination or uh, marginalization in society. So 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so you you mentioned you know some some uh, events that uh, and support that you've gathered from you know Asian American colleagues that you have. Um, were there any other um, things or events that you've observed um, in our respective communities that may pose as challenges towards collaborative work? Yeah, no, um, certainly. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, you know, while, while I am sort of proposing that, you know, we do a better job of, 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 of supporting each other and, and the issues that that impact our you know respective communities i'm also aware that you know there are there are some tensions that sometimes surface mm -hmm. you know in our in our pursuit of trying to to support um this notion of sort of you know in division 45 we call it unity through diversity that's mm -hmm. our sort of our slogan um there there are tensions that arise that we you know have to you know Honestly, sort of confront and 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 deal with, and so you know certainly there have I think sometimes been been some tensions between you know um, the black community and the Asian American community, just as there have been tensions you know in other and across other racial and ethnic communities as well. Um, I, I think that you know with regarding tensions that I've observed um, in African American and, and Asian American communities, I, I think that part of it is, and I, I think. Um, the sense among some that that Asian Americans and and given the imposed sort of so-called model minority status, that I think that there may be some Black folks who believe that that um, Asian folks, Asian Americans, are for all intents and purposes honorary whites, and that they don't have they don't have the same racial struggles that that Black folks have. And so mm -hmm. I, I think, and I think that's unfortunate. And I and I would imagine that. Um, there would be folks in the um, Asian American community who would resent that because, mm -hmm. you know, we know, and, and as you started off talking about, you know, some of the anti-Asian racism, you know, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so so I, I think that we have to sort of have those sort of honest conversations um, with each other and, and, and to really see that all this does is sort of work in service of white supremacy that yeah. seeks to sort of keep communities of color at odds with each other. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I, I think that's the last question that I have. Um, and I really do appreciate your time, which I know is very precious and you're incredibly busy. Um, I do appreciate your time um, to come and talk to us and to educate us, and, you know, about um, the, the Black American communities and how we can better support that particular community. Because I know right now it's really suffering quite a bit. Um, from COVID, from, you know, what's going on in, in our society, not just this year, but for years. It's, it just so happens that we have iPhones now that we can record everything. Yeah. And we can see it live. So it's, yeah, it's an in, intense time in our country. But again, uh, much appreciated, Dr. Coakley. And um, thank you again for your time. I truly do appreciate it. Um, Thank you. I was honored to be the inaugural person. How did, you, how did you come to choose me as as your first person? To you know, well, you are you came in highly recommended by so many people. So I am one of the LDI fellows, and uh, Wendy, and um, I don't know if you remember Charlotte McCloskey. Mm -hmm. So um, they both um, jump and told me like, you gotta get Kevin Coakley. Um, she, he's great, he's wonderful, and then get his wife after. <laughs> so, and I do wanna speak to your wife after. I've heard a lot of good things about her too, cause um, Amina Sai is uh, mm -hmm. another sister program that we have and, you know, uh, another community that's not really, you know, addressed quite heavily in, in, in our field. So it, I think it's really important to bring that to the forefront as well. I will give her a heads up. <laughs> I'll tell her to wait for my email. <laughs> well, good luck with everything this semester. Um, hopefully it's not as insane in your end because I know I, I all of my classes are online right now, so I'm teaching remotely. Yeah, um, same here. Yeah, oh my goodness. It's, it's tough teaching via Zoom. 
Um, but stay safe, you and your family, and um, hopefully we can chat sometime soon and not just through through this um, project that I have. And again, thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.